deep inside, there's a huge part of me that's gone. The horror is once you get out, trying to get back what you've lost. When you're on that side of the bars and there's no way, there's no hope, there's no crack, you give up. Took away a big portion of my life. Took away my life with my children. I mean, what happened to the word investigation? Helpless fear, anger, and, and revenge, and, and wanting people to be held accountable for what had happened to me. And why? Why did you do it? What possessed you to play God? I knew my life was over right there. Having my family taken away, everything taken away from me. I had my life stolen away for 25.5 years for a crime I didn't commit. You can't get that time back. Hi, I'm Kelly Fanson. And I'm Kelly Lozon. And this is Real Life Wrongs, where we dive into the stories, the crimes, and the hard times of the complicated world of wrongful convictions. Episode 12, The Thing We Don't Talk About. Guests, Emily Haney Karen and Erica Fountain. Big topic today. Although we navigate each of the system errors that cause wrongful convictions, Marginalization is an encompassing topic because 99.9% .9 of the time, marginalization is where a wrongful conviction begins. We're not going to solve the inequalities of the world on our podcast today, but we are going to acknowledge its existence and its pervasive impact. Racism, prejudice, the human condition. But let's keep a lid on the jar. Kelly, what is marginalization? In its simplest terms, it's the treatment of a person or a group of people as insignificant. I think many people might think marginalization pertains solely to race. Race is one cause of marginalization, but the truth is that people can be marginalized for any number of reasons. Their race, their socioeconomic status, their religion, their mental capacity, or anything else that makes them different. Because these people pose a threat to the status quo, there's a belief that they should be cast to the margins of society to avoid interfering with our comfort zone. They're basically looked at as other and treated as disposable. So let's talk about the old comfort zone. And I do mean old because old thinking can cause a resistance to change, which includes feeling threatened by something you don't understand. In an uncertain world, survival requires radar. Let's call it instinct. If we go way back in time, humans at the mercy of wild predators or impending natural disasters would learn to trust their instincts or feelings, which undoubtedly saved lives. So emotions became our first screen to receiving information, emotion before reason. Today, in a more modern world, we're encouraged to dispense with emotions in favor of rational analysis. But evolutionary psychology suggests that emotions can never be fully suppressed. If emotions are just part of the deal and our memory and perception of things we see and hear can't be fully trusted, where does that leave us in a human justice system? You might say science, but science often goes through human hands. Are we just going to dispense with emotion because the law simply says we must? Theoretically, we're all equal under the law, but we somehow, but somehow we know or feel that's not the case. Isn't there always gonna be some kind of bias or prejudice, whether we're aware of it or not? Just because someone takes an oath doesn't magically erase what they've learned through the course of their lives. So whether you're an attorney, judge, clerk, police officer, or you, me, a jury member, what are your biases? You don't just snap into an entirely new way of thinking just because you step into the jury box. This isn't where the jury selection process is supposed to protect us against our own biases, right? In theory, yeah, it's supposed to do that. Right, because we have a process in place to ensure we have an unbiased jury. We do, but it's random. Okay. How so? Uh, in a nutshell, a jury summons is sent out to a big group of people. They show up to court, and from that group, 12 random people are selected. Selection suggests vetting. So I thought 
you could ask potential jury members questions to make sure they don't bring biases into the box. Yeah, that's because you watch American television. True. (laughs) I haven't sat on a jury yet, so. But, you know, (laughs) what you see on TV is. Yeah, I'm like, they're going to they're going to weed us all out. Yeah, well, you know, what you see on TV is generally how it works in the States. Of course, there are some differences from state to state, but generally they can ask questions. In Canada, we work under the assumption that all prospective jurors who show up for jury duty are able to set their biases aside and make an impartial decision, so we don't need to ask them about it. Really, the only time lawyers have a chance to ask potential jurors any questions is when they believe there's a real potential that the jury pool is made up of people who aren't impar- who aren't impartial. And then they can use what's called a challenge for cause. But this isn't an automatic thing. The lawyer has to prove that a widespread bias exists in the community and that some jurors are incapable of setting their biases aside despite all the trial safeguards that we have in place. But even if your request is granted, this doesn't mean they get carte blanche like on TV. They'll only be able to ask one, maybe two questions that are directly related to the jury's ability to act impartially in this case. And the question has to be answered only with a yes or a no. So, for example, they'd be limited to asking something like, would your ability to judge the evidence in this case without bias, prejudice, or partiality be affected by the fact that the accused is black? So really the only information that lawyers would have about each potential juror is their name, their address, their juror number, and possibly a yes or no answer to a pointed question. Is this enough screening? Well, in Canada, we like to think so. You know, and if you think about it, the lawyers can glean some pretty important information just based off of your address. How so? So um, in Ottawa, where I live, there are certain parts of the city where only wealthy people can afford to live. And there's certain parts of the city that are predominantly student rentals. And then there are the seedier parts of the city. So if the address falls in one of those areas, you'll have a pretty good idea of how much money they make, whether they come from a more conservative or more liberal neighborhood. And based on that, you can get an idea of their age. You know, all of these things are important when considering who you want to be part of your jury, because each of these things could open the door for biases and prejudices to enter the jury room. And this is really all we have to work with information wise. Yeah, I mean, Up until a couple of years ago, we also allowed the use of peremptory challenges. What are those? So that was when either side could exclude a potential juror for no reason. All they had to say was challenge and that person was removed from the jury pool. Okay, so is it a good thing that we got rid of those? Um, You know, like anything else, it really depends on which side of the fence you're on. Right. Like on the one hand, the argument for getting rid of them was to prevent lawyers from exercising racist practices when selecting their jury. But the other side of the argument is that by getting rid of these challenges, we're preventing the accused from having a say in building a jury of their peers. Some go so far as to say that this was actually a good tool that helped build a more diverse jury. But let's look at this a little bit differently. Let's say you're on trial for a child sexual assault. And when you're selecting the jury, there are some people who can't even look at you. They obviously have some contempt and some disgust directed at you for what you're accused of. So in the past, you could just say challenge and they wouldn't be part of your jury. But now you can't get rid of them. You have to accept them as part of your jury unless you can prove there's a definite reason for bias. Can you ask them straight out? No, you cannot ask them. Our jury system is built on the assumption that everyone can just put their biases aside. 
this is the whole assumption that everybody can set their biases aside is that we're working with the presumption of innocence, but we know it's almost a human condition that this is not the presumption that we tend to operate under as soon as somebody walks into court. I mean, when I'm teaching my class, we have this conversation and it always comes back around to, but you know, I don't have these problems and I don't have these thoughts and whatnot, but the more we have class discussions, they realize, huh, maybe I do, right? Like it, it's just, this is the way you were raised. This is what you were taught to think and believe and hold true. So to you, it's not a bias to you. This is the way that things are. Right. Yeah. You know, we don't so question our own biases very often. And so all of a sudden, poof, you got jury duty. So I think, you know, the whole conversation brings us back to the original question of whether peremptory challenges were a good thing or not, right? Because yeah. you could just challenge. Right. So, okay. Now we have 12 people in a box listening to a case. And now they retire to the deliberation room where it's assumed they can make an unbiased decision. This is... Right. That, that's the that's the goal. Yeah. Um, you know, ideally, we have 12 people who bring different perspectives and experiences to the jury room. Mm -hmm. And so the hope is that their biases would cancel each other out. There it and is. They'd, and they'd end up meeting somewhere in the middle when they decide on a verdict. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is we don't get that because many juries are composed of retired middle-class white people. I mean, sorry, still? Yeah. Yeah. Because when you think about it, some trials can go on for an inordinately long period of time and you're not getting paid for jury duty. Okay. Okay. Actually, like full disclosure, you, you get a really small sum for your service. It's something like 20 to $50 a day. Right. Depending That's on not how many, even parking money. No, exactly. And it, and it depends on how many days into the trial you are. Like the first 10 days you get zero. And then I think it's like the next 10 days you get 20. And then after that you get 40 or, you know, something like this anyways. Um, and, and again, like who's going to pay their bills when they're making this right. And you know, who can afford to give that amount of time, not only financially, but you know, without the risk of losing your job. And, you know, who does that leave us with? It's people who have a fixed guaranteed income, certainly not gig workers or university students and not the single income family mom or dad. Yeah. So you end up with 12 people with, let's say, similar backgrounds in the deliberation room, fewer perspectives, I guess which is what's supposed to cancel out the biases. So you can't take the sapiens out of the human. And, you know, awareness is quite frankly, our best hope. Do we, can we, are we? <laughs> yeah, well, you're right though. Awareness, so many questions. You're right. Awareness is our best hope. And, you know, if we really want to understand what's going on, we have to look at the justice system through a two-tiered analysis. First, we need to look at the hands-on work of those who run the justice system, because like it or not, their actions are what leads to every conviction, wrongful and not. And second, we need to take the time to understand how the systemic inequalities that are endemic to our society, political, economic and social, how they lead to the marginalization of large groups of people, some of whom ultimately become wrongfully convicted. Right. Bias, prejudice has a way of working itself into our daily lives. I mean, it is our daily lives. If justice was blind, we'd all be equal under the law. But justice is no more than an abstract concept based on vague ideas about good and bad. I, I mean, I like I like how you say vague ideas <laughs> about good and bad, because really, this is what our laws are based on, you know, and over time, as laws become formalized and codified, they become a way for maintaining the social order and to direct our attention towards the individual wrongdoers who are largely the marginalized. Um, you know, I think the idea behind the justice system is that it's there to help us find fair, re fair resolutions to conflicts 
as opposed to just being able to randomly accuse people of misdeeds. Like we shouldn't be able to accuse someone of something horrible just because we don't like them. But you don't have to look very far to find examples of the exact opposite happening and the justice system not doing anything to stop it. I mean, look at the case of the Central Park Five, now known as the Exonerated Five. These were five young black and brown boys who were treated with hostility for no other reason than the color of their skin. Yeah. So let's why don't we dive in and look at some cases, some some examples to get an idea of how far reaching the issue of marginalization is. It isn't a one size fits all pro, uh, problem. No. And, and that's a great point. I think it's easy to look at cases of wrongful conviction and point out all the system errors and say this is where things went wrong. But it's equally important to take a step back and acknowledge that hanging over all of this was the fact that the victim was a marginalized individual, some in more obvious ways than others. Let's talk about how marginalization affects the jury, because we're all potential jurors and we must be aware that it works its way into the courtroom, into the deliberation room. Let's. Yeah. Let's dig into, you know, what we need to know. We're all potentially there. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. You know, it, it absolutely wor works its way into the jury room. And like we talked about, even though a jury room or even though a jury should come to a verdict based on nothing other than the evidence presented at trial, we know there are other things that can affect jurors' decisions. Things that are legally irrelevant, like someone's physical appearance, their race, their gender, their lifestyle. You know, these things are known as extra legal factors. They're things that have absolutely nothing to do with the case, but can have a strong effect on the jury's decision. And extra legal factors are important because someone's guilt or innocence could be decided not based on the evidence, but on a juror's personal feelings going back to where we started. So it basically becomes guilty by association because the defendant has characteristics that, I don't know, for some reason may make you more likely to convict, more likely to find someone guilty. They remind you of someone you don't like or don't trust, and you're not even fully aware that that's happening to you. Yeah, and mock jury studies show us that jurors have a hard time setting aside their preconceived ideas, even when they're instructed to do so. We know that jurors tend to consider extra legal information and then make inferences about the accused, even if they know that that information shouldn't be considered or even when evidence is presented that discredits their thoughts. Even if we want it to be true, even if we'd like to think that everyone could set these biases aside, it's just factually not the case. Yeah. The case of Gerald Stanley is an interesting example of marginalization affecting the jury because this wasn't a case where someone was convicted because of their marginalized status. This was a case where someone actually got acquitted because it was the victim who was marginalized. Yeah, th this is a really important case in Canada. So in 2016, five young Indigenous youth drove onto Gerald Stanley's farm. And he was a white farmer in rural Saskatchewan. And it's not entirely clear how or why the group ended up on Stanley's property, but the most commonly accepted theory is that their vehicle had broken down and they were possibly looking to steal a vehicle to get back home. So Stanley noticed the group and it appeared to him that they were attempting to take one of his ATVs. And at this point, Stanley grabbed one of his shotguns and fired a warning shot in the air. After firing the warning shot, Mr. Stanley approached the group who were now in their vehicle. Stanley smashed the windshield and reached into the vehicle. At this point, the gun went off and hit one of the young people, Colton Bushi, I believe, in the head. He died instantly. What's important in this case is how the jury interpreted the victim as a marginalized youth, someone who was different and probably there to cause 
trouble. The jury used this status against him in their decision at Mr. Stanley's trial. Ultimately, the jury acquitted Stanley of the murder. Remember, this is the case of a white rural farmer accused of murdering a young on reserve indigenous male. And the jury in this case was made up of 12 white people. So the victim in this case didn't have a single member of his community or his background speaking up or making decisions in the jury room. There's no way for the jury to consider Mr. Bushy's point of view. I don't think it's a big leap to say that an all white jury could empathize with Mr. Stanley much easier than maybe they could with a young indigenous man. For sure. For sure. And then there's the case of Guy Paul Morin. This one is always a bit of a head scratcher because Guy was a 20 year old middle class white male. He and his family were marginalized by their uh, community for reasons other than their appearance. They were marginalized because they were considered kind of weird. Uh, his family kept to themselves. Their house and yard were messy. They worked on old cars until the middle of the night frequently. Uh, they had beehives on their property. I mean, a lot of people like that are admired today, but uh, Guy came under further scrutiny because he was in his 20s and still lived at home. Um, again, a lot of that going on now. Um, you know, so we're going back in time here. Uh, but he also had funny speech patterns and word choices. So when you put all of this together, he was considered weird. And so he was cast to the margins of his community. Yeah. And and I 100% agree with you. This case really is a head scratcher. And it's definitely not one that you would immediately think of as an example of marginalization. But it's actually a really good example of how social intolerance causes people to become the target of negative public attitudes and victims of the forces of social control. Guy was charged and convicted for the murder of Christine Jessup, not on the basis of strong evidence or good police work, but because of who he was and how he acted. He was targeted because of the relationship that he had with his community. He was someone that could be singled out really easily and persecuted in a time of crisis. So in this case, just being weird was enough to invoke the ire of the police and the community and ultimately the criminal justice system. I think this is a great time to turn to our two guests, um, Dr. Emily haney Karen and Dr. Erica Fountain. Dr. Haney Karen is an assistant professor of psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. She's a licensed attorney and a licensed clinical psychologist. And Dr. Fountain is an assistant professor at the University of Baltimore. Her current research looks at how adolescents and their families navigate the justice system. And she looks specifically to answer questions about plea bargaining and legal decision making. We were so fortunate to speak with both of um, Emily and Erica shortly after they published their article, Young, Black, and Wrongfully Charged. And this was an important article that aimed to expand our understanding of the term wrongful conviction. For them, wrongful convictions shouldn't just include cases where people are factually innocent, but instead it should include, you know, any time that someone becomes involved in the criminal justice system when they never should have been in the first place. And, you know, they have a focus on the intersection of youth and race. So it was really a privilege to speak with them. And like I said, shortly after uh, they, they published this great article. The, the prominent biases that exist vary in geographic regions, right? Very sure. by country. And so really, you know, what seems to happen is that the juvenile and criminal legal systems replicate the biases that exist in our cultures, right? But with the full force of the law behind them. And so in, you know, in the United States, um, in regions where sort of the predominant biases tend to be against Black youth, 
then we're going to see that play out in the legal system. In places where we see that the predominant biases are against Latinx youth or against Native youth, like we're going to see that replicated in the legal system as well. And so sort of the, the worst biases and stereotypes that exist in our communities and in our societies end up kind of reified in the legal system and, and brought to life with the force of the law behind them. In terms of wrongful conviction literature, it generally focuses on, you know, the traditional, for lack of a better term, factors, right, where uh, wrongful convictions are created because of false confessions, because of faulty eyewitness testimony, because of, you know, erroneous uh, plea deals or faulty forensics, et cetera, et cetera. And race is usually such it's almost an afterthought, even though, you know, it seems to be mixed in with everything else. So what drove your research to look at race specifically as a contributing factor um, or as a risk factor for wrongful convictions, right? Like you weren't looking at it specifically in relation to other factors, correct? When we think about false confessions and, you know, wrongful eyewitness identifications, and we know that like own race bias plays a role in that. But we also know that in false confessions, there's a lot of, um, you know, interrogation decision making that happens or interrogator decision making happens that is going to vary by race and is going to be responsive to race. We know that police tend to see um, Black youth as uh, more mature and as having more and legal actors seeing black youth as having more of a criminal disposition than white youth. And so just, you, I, I have a hard time thinking about race as its own unique factor, but rather it's kind of without, you know, when you think, when you lay race out as kind of the backdrop by which all of this is happening on top of racism, that is, um, all of these, you know, you can look at wrongful convictions and false confessions and mis uh, mistaken IDs and all of these things, kind of everything looks different when you account for race within those um, factors. And when we start talking about individual factors related to, you know, the, the defendant or the suspect, it gets really complicated because it's hard, right? It's, it's not that, you know, being Black makes you at risk for a false confession, right? It's that our racially biased society sort of primes everyone to respond in a particular way to a racialized individual, right? And so it becomes much harder to identify, like, what exactly is it that the police are doing? You know, what is it that we have as beliefs in our society that is contributing to there being this association between minoritized race and risk of wrongful conviction? And that becomes so hard to untangle and identify any real intervention point for what it looks like to change it, that I think that's part of why research has sort of had it as kind of an afterthought, if at all. Um, but I think our perspective is that it's really impossible to figure out how to fix any of the system problems, to fix the things that, say, police interrogators are doing without recognizing that that process doesn't play out the same for all suspects, right? Like, what is happening in that interrogation room is likely very different when there is a Black suspect or a Latinx suspect compared to a white suspect. And so we really wanted to think about, like, what would it look like to focus on that first, to focus on, um, you know, what, what it is that the, the system is doing to respond um, to someone in a racially biased way that then is putting them at risk you know, for all of these, these system problems that we know exist that are well documented in the research. It's really about recognizing um, that we, you know, we live in a culture that's infused with white supremacy. And so we all have been sort of swimming in these waters of white supremacy and absorbing these messages. And so the way that we all act then enacts those messages. Um, and so it's really about figuring out ways to shift how our systems work to make it more difficult for these internalized biases that every single one of us holds to play a role in our decisions. Because it's Sometimes it is, but it's mostly not about an individual 
you know, racist police officer or racist judge or whatever intentionally acting in a biased way. Instead, it's these messages that we've absorbed for our whole lives that lead us to respond differently to, you know, a black suspect versus a white suspect. And so it's not about kind of catching anyone or calling any one person out, but rather shifting our systems to make it so that those biases don't impact suspects or defendants in the same way. I mean, I guess our system shifts when society shifts. I mean, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. Yes. Yeah, I think it is. And I think it's right. This is not an easy problem or one that we're about to solve overnight. But I think part of the first step is is really recognizing the scope of the problem. Um, And as a society and as researchers starting to grapple with kind of understanding how serious of a problem it is and really committing to try to figure out ways to address it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things we tried to say, or what we try to say in in taking that first step is that research really does need to take a more, uh, researchers need to take a more um, really focused approach of thinking about race within each one of their studies. Um, thinking about how race plays a role in, in, in how, and in, in well, not just like as a variable in our, you know, cross tabs, but rather seeing how these things play out for, for kids of color versus white youth and also seeing how legal actors respond um, differently if and when across system time points. So we can start to really capture a more holistic view of how this is playing out. Um, Because I do believe that it's the case that many people think like, well, I'm not racist, so I'm not going to perpetuate these types of things. And really, we need to kind of take a step back and recognize that the entire system is is really being uh, motive, moved by these kind of racist ideals and policies and perceptions. And that's why it ends up playing out the way that it does. And to acknowledge it doesn't mean we need to place blame. We need to start with the acknowledgement so we can start to fix it. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if, so we can I, see where these patterns emerge and, how, and where they need to be kind of uh, fixed and, and responded to. One thing that did come up in the literature while I was reviewing for this a lot was... Um, and again, focusing on youth, but youth being more, um, further kind of disadvantaged by being, you know, coming from a family that suffered from, you know, that was maybe not, um, lived in a neighborhood marked by structural disadvantage, for example, right? And that would definitely play a role, for example, in stakeholder decisions around whether or not to place that youth. So again, I think it just kind of it's um, oftentimes these different forms of marginalization build on each other and compound each other. A lot of times if you're uh, a racialized or, you know, marginalized because of race, you're also marginalized because of socioeconomic status or, um, you know, if you're marginalized because of intellectual disabilities, you're also uh, likely to be from a lower socioeconomic status and you likely have less social Mm. capital and you know so they all so to try to extract each different area where a person may be marginalized becomes very difficult because Mm -hmm. they are so interwoven and they do compound on each other yeah and i think that's one of the things we 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 you know, we are not doing this perfectly either, but wanted to kind of cast some light out on is the fact that really to capture the impact of the system, we need to think in this somewhat more messy way, right? Recognizing that, you know, people don't fit into these individual boxes, but rather are going to be um, walking through the system with their own compound marginalization, if you want to call it that. Um, And that that is going to play a role in how the system responds to them and how they respond and how they are affected by it. And that's a great point because it's true. People don't fit into boxes as much as we like to try to have neat, discrete boxes and categories. I don't know that anyone fits into one box. One thing that I think is worth um, noting, though, is that when we're thinking about, um, you know, particularly since this is our focus, youth in the juvenile legal system, Although there are lots of ways in which youth can be marginalized in that system and put at much sort of risk of much worse outcomes, um, including, as you mentioned, 
socioeconomic status or financial resources, certainly um, including sexual orientation and gender identity. You know, there are lots of there are lots of identities that we know lead to worse outcomes for youth in the system. But there is, in some ways, something that is unique about the way that racial marginalization leads to worse outcomes because the juvenile legal system, from its inception, was really set up to marginalize youth of color and particularly black youth. And that that makes race different in, in that respect. Um, instead of thinking of a wrongful conviction as sort of the traditional definition where it's a time when someone who was factually innocent of a crime ended up convicted of that crime, right? Like that's what we think of as wrongful conviction. Instead, we're really hoping to create a conversation around expanding that definition to think about it as a wrongful conviction is anytime someone is pulled into the system and adjudicated delinquent or convicted um, for not doing anything worse than just typical age normative behavior. And so that certainly includes times when people are convicted of a crime that they are factually innocent of, but it also includes pulling kids, primarily kids of color, into the system for behavior that they did actually do, but that is just typical adolescent behavior. So for example, getting in a fight after school is just something that happens in adolescence. But when it happens for youth of color and particularly Black youth, we tend to arrest them for it and charge them with assault, right? And so that we see as a wrongful conviction because we're pulling kids into the system for just being kids, for making some bad choices that you certainly could classify as criminal, but that really at their core are just normal youthful behavior. And so I think, you know, although there's not a lot of research on how that plays out for Indigenous youth, my guess is that that same process likely happens with Indigenous youth, where behavior you know, that that for white youth is forgiven as seen as typical adolescence is probably criminalized for indigenous youth so that they're being arrested for things that that white youth are given support for or that's just kind of completely ignored and given a pass. If I could just break through this or if I could make a change to this, I mean, I there's so much. I don't know if Emily agrees with this, but we've talked a little bit about this because, you know, I think when we were working on this paper, we both really stopped and thought about our own programs of research and how we needed to start rethinking the way we did things, not just telling other people to do things differently. And I kept coming back and I I am not, I don't focus on policing in my work, but I kept coming back to policing and the way we criminalize adolescent behavior, which is what we're just talking about, as kind of a major area uh, in, in need of more focus because it is really Really where everything starts. Uh, I think like intervening at the adjudicatory stage is too late often. And I, I focus on court process. Um, so I think that I've been thinking a lot about that lately, haven't really put it into action. But uh, another area that I've been focusing on is trying to look more at um, less at individual factors within the, the kid themselves and more about the structural or, or kind of even just like city level factors that might be contributing to making it difficult for them to, for instance, succeed on probation. Like, I think there are so many layers to this that we often overlook and don't, don't measure or think about that, um, really are not allowing us to see the full picture. But I think you're right. It's, it's such a huge topic. And, and part of the difficulty is, okay, where do we focus without losing focus of the other time points of the other factors? It kind of needs to be a big, messy topic. And that's not great for, you know, traditional experimental research. So we kind of have to expand our way of thinking about how we do this too. So, you know, as researchers, we're collecting data and drawing conclusions about the system and identifying these problems sort of in our in our academic silo and then leaving the information there. We publish it. Um, maybe some other researchers read it, but m- mostly the general public doesn't and mostly legal actors don't. And so as much as possible, I think there has to be a shift in the field so that more conversations are happening between researchers and public defenders and prosecutors and judges and police um, so that the people who are making decisions about the legal system and and legislators as well, certainly, who are making policy um, have access to the data to identify what best practices 
might look like. And then also researchers have information from people who are doing this work on the ground, who have dedicated their lives to working within these systems to be able to design research studies that actually make sense, that reflect the system as it presently exists. And so, you know, I I think a lot of times those conversations are happening within one field where defense attorneys are talking to defense attorneys and, and researchers are talking to researchers. And I think there really needs to be a move to create more conversations across those disciplinary divides. And I would we, add we this crazy thing where we can all communicate now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like, let's Honestly, uh, we use uh, it better. <laughs> Honestly, I think most of, uh, you know, just kind of piggybacking on what Emily was just saying, I think a lot of the, like my, my best ideas and my best work come from just having conversations with lawyers and and people who are working with kids. And, and I think Emily and I's project probably also really stemmed from that as well, because she's doing that way more than I am even. So I just, it, I think we could, our work is, is only made so much stronger and better by having that kind of cross-disciplinary conversation and, and collaboration, not just conversation, but true collaboration on, on research. Um, it's just so, it's, it's strengthened so much by that. And we don't, we don't really, we're not really trained to do that in, in graduate school. And I think, I think that's starting to shift hopefully, um, but it really needs to. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, it makes me think of those like small town murder scenarios where like this police station or this like local sheriff like won't talk to the sheriff in the <laughs> town and it's like it's happening right over there like if you guys yeah. could get together yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> whatever so frustrating no and i think I, I i think just to add to the you know collaboration i think it's important that you know, on top of defense attorneys and prosecutors and policymakers, et cetera, that the conversation is also opened up with potential jury members, right? Because they are also making decisions and often they are not aware of all the stuff that researchers are aware of and that you have uncovered. And it's important to continue that conversation beyond the professional walls, I think, you know, which is partly why we're doing this podcast in the first place, right? Is to help to help have that conversation and help spread the word. And uh, you know, and I just wanted to come back to what you were saying, Emily, about broadening the conversation of wrongful convictions, because one of the things I always uh or one of the first things I teach in my wrongful conviction class is Wrongful convictions don't just happen in the courtroom. They are not only the result of the verdict, right? That there's this whole process that goes on before. And I think that this is something we lose sight of. And we being society as a whole, I think we lose sight of this, right? Because we just look at guilty or not guilty, the end, right? But there's so much more at play. And I think it is so important that we look at what's going on before we get to the courtroom, right? Because we're pulling people into the system unnecessarily, it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then using up, you know, massive amounts of societal resources to, um, to criminalize people who, don't need to be criminalized, right? So so society is better off if they're not criminalized. They're better off if they're not criminalized. But nevertheless, we've developed a system where we are devoting massive amounts of resources to sort of pulling people in and then entrenching them in this legal system that then once you're inside of is so so challenging to get out of. Um, and, and, you know, from a sort of traditional wrongful conviction lens, oftentimes sort of the wrongful convictions that the general public is aware of are the ones that receive a lot of publicity. And and those tend to be really horrific cases, right? So we think about the Central Park Five, for example, where we have this case where these young kids were, you know, really pushed and and coerced during police interviews to provide a particular narrative. And then, um, you know, basically like all of, all of the evidence, um, 
that that made it so clear that they had not been involved at all was just ignored, at, you know, with the goal of just moving forward in this court process. And there are certainly so many cases like that. But the reason that those cases get attention is because the stakes are are you know so high in those cases where it, we're talking about a murder conviction, we're talking about cases that received a lot of publicity, um, we're talking about cases that you know often received life sentences, or there's you know in some cases a death penalty sentence. Those are the cases where resources are going to be devoted to ultimately be able to prove that the person who was convicted didn't commit the crime. But that's playing out undoubtedly in a huge number of lower stakes cases, right? This is a system. And and when you think about our, you know, I mean, this is Emily and I's thinking right now, of this reconceptualization of capturing kind of the wrongful charging of normal adolescent behavior, right? You That, it, that net just expands and kind of explodes because we know that a lot of kids are being pulled into the system for that. And that one adjudication of that one kid for simple assault, if you will, for, you know, getting into a fight after school, if they are ever kind of re you know re-entered into the system, which you know the data tells us they likely will be, that is just going to set them up for harsher consequences and more deeper system involvement later. So bringing them in for this very minor, maybe should never have even had contact with the system because of this behavior, um, is really going to just set them up for this cascade of worse outcomes. And we know that typically is going to be more likely to be applied to black kids than it is to white kids. And so it just and although our focus is on race, I think, you know, there are other scholars who have a focus that's far beyond that. And so when we're thinking about people whose behavior is criminalized, even though it is not actually criminal, um, you know, also we do so much criminalizing of, um, you know, people who are living on the streets, who don't have access to homes, right, that that existing becomes a criminal offense and we're pulling people into the system for not having a place to sleep at night. Um, we know that, you know, for um, trans folks and gender queer folks that that we criminalize their very gender presentation, right? So that like, again, existing in the world um, becomes a criminal offense. And, and certainly we do that for people who are living in poverty, um, where we impose, you know, fines and fees for being poor that then ultimately end up to, to commonly to people being incarcerated because they don't have financial resources. And so, you know, we look at this for youthfulness in ways that just being a typical kid can be criminalized if, you know, if you are a kid who's living in poverty, if you are um, a racial minority youth, but but it's so much broader than that. There are so many ways in society that we we criminalize people's very existence um, that goes so much further beyond somebody, you know, being wrongfully accused of a murder, for example. When you look at, you know, kind of the way um, resources are laid out, uh, the way police are are policing certain areas over others, you can you can start to see how that is going to inevitably play a role in who's policed, who's criminalized, and who's not. I think for me, the take home message of what Emily and I have really been focusing on for, I don't know, a little over the past year, maybe, I don't know, my, my sense of time is completely gone this year, but um, is that the way kids of color are experienced, the legal system is incredibly different from the way that other youth do. And in general, what we end up seeing is that, you know, the we don't allow kids of color to truly be kids and we overcriminalize their misbehavior in a way we don't do for kids who have more privilege in our society and they end up being um, exposed to a system that is very hard to exit and that does often result in um, just continued uh, disadvantage and sanction for them. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I think um, sort of maybe sort of based on that, an additional takeaway is that whatever sort of spheres of influence you have as, you know, whatever, you know, whoever you are as a listener, um, 
is really, you know, we're, we're calling on you to think about what it would look like to do your own little piece of, of disrupting this system that we have that criminalizes kids of color and, and sort of tears their lives apart in the process. And so if you are someone who is an employer and makes decisions about who to hire, um, maybe you, you don't need to look at someone's criminal record or juvenile record, recognizing that the existence of that record doesn't necessarily mean what you think it means. Um, maybe, Mm -hmm. you know, if, if you have any involvement in your local education system, it means making sure that the opportunities for kids to be criminalized in schools are profoundly reduced. Maybe it means going to school board meetings and advocating for removing uh, police officers from schools or for changing school disciplinary practices. Um, if you, you know, are a landlord, it means renting to people, even if they've been pulled into the legal system. And if, if none of those apply to you, then I think it means writing letters to your legislators and letting them know how important it is to you that there be juvenile justice reform, that there be reform around policing um, to help treat kids like kids and and allow them to have their childhoods and their adolescence undisrupted. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you both so much for being here, spending this time. I think the thing to remember here is that it's easy to blame the system. And yes, the system has its flaws, but let's not forget that we are the system. Change starts with us and change doesn't have to be something huge that we think we can never achieve. So why even try? Change can be as simple as let's not judge a book by its cover. Let's be patient and compassionate with people who don't look like us or who don't act like us. We all have value. Let's just try to appreciate it. So Homo sapiens emerged on the Savannah Plain some 200,000 years ago. Yet according to evolutionary psychology, human beings think and exhibit the same behaviors now as we did then. In other words, we're hardwired. So do we change? We certainly strive to be better. We attempt to correct what's wrong. With every shift towards tolerance, we hope to become more civilized, more accepting, more loving. But is it just a hope? The world of wrongful convictions is a living hell for individuals who end up in it. And believe it or not, it could happen to anyone. Know the law, know how to look for flaws in the system, understand how marginalization works, and most of all, talk about it. Thanks for listening. I'm Kelly Fanson. And I'm Kelly Lozo. All of us could falsely confess to something. They blew it all out of proportion and they got away with it. Even a country like Canada has people uh, who are charged and convicted of crimes they didn't commit. There's innocent people who are going to die in prison. Just, I can't get back the time that they took from me. And I was just left wondering, like, what the hell is happening? I knew my life was over right there. That's when my life ended. They're changing the story. I told them that to match to what really happened. I was just incarcerated for 37 years for somebody else's crime. That what happened to me could easily happen to anybody. Real Life Wrongs is produced by Kelly Fanson. Edited by Alex Glutch. Promotional materials by Jamie Norrie.